Welcome to the 25th uh, webinar, monthly webinar of Med Ed webinar, webinar series. Uh, so far, we have more than 2,100 registered members from 22 countries. I welcome you all. And topic for today is blueprinting assessment and curricular content. Let us start with some very familiar statements uh, usually given by our students about the essay type of questions. Too lengthy, time not enough to write. All questions on few systems only. Too vague, what to write, what to cut. Are long questions were bouncers. I have not been taught means out of syllabus. That is one issue. The second issue, some topics get repeated multiple times in different methods of assessment, such as multiple choice questions, essays, objective structured clinical examinations, short cases, long cases, and other methods, etc. So these are two problem statements with which the blueprinting can uh, deal very effectively. So the learning outcomes for uh, today's session, after attending this webinar, the participants will be able to explain the concept of blueprinting in medical education, to apply blueprinting for students' assessment in their institutions. Three, apply blueprinting for identification of curricular content in their institutions. To comprehend the concept of blueprinting very well, we need to have a clear understanding of these three concepts. Number one, program learning outcomes, constructive alignment, and appropriate methods of assessment. The program educational objectives apply to graduates few years after graduation, means that few years after graduation, for example, what percentage of your graduates would go for specialization and what kind of specialties they would choose. Program learning outcomes are the knowledge, skills, attitudes, et cetera, what a graduate would be able to do or would have the ability to perform immediately after graduation. In other words, we can convert it into entrustable professional activities. Then we have course learning outcomes, for example, physiology or anatomy or pediatrics uh, course learning outcomes. And then we have topic learning outcomes. So it's depending upon the teaching session, whether lecture or seminar. So what are the expected learning outcomes of that session? Now we have to have a clear alignment between all these learning outcomes. And blueprinting can help align all these learning outcomes in the curriculum as well as in the assessment. Coming to the concept of constructive alignment, there has to be a clear linkage between intended learning outcomes, teaching learning activities or methods, and assessments. Another view is that having a clear link between learning outcomes, the content, the teaching learning methods, and the assessment. Here is an example. The learning outcome, for example, on graduation, a student will be able to perform lumbar puncture under supervision and interpret the results. So this is our learning outcome at after graduation. To achieve this learning outcome, we need to identify appropriate content 
the teaching learning strategies as well as the assessment. So in this case, the content might include anatomy of the spinal column and spinal cord, surface anatomy of spinal column, physiology of CSF, functions, production, circulations, etc. Et normal contents of CSF and interpretation of results. Apart from this knowledge uh, con uh, component, there has to be a skill of taking a consent from the patient or attendance, a skill of aseptic technique, and then performing the procedure and collection of specimen, transport of specimen, and then care of the patient after the procedure. So these are the contents which are required to achieve uh, those, uh, that learning outcome. Now, Important word here is the action work of perform. If the learning outcome says that student will be able to perform, then we have to provide opportunities for students to have hands-on practice and should be assessed uh, similarly. For example, taking concept can be taught through role play whereas the anatomy of spinal column and spinal cord can be taught through interactive lecture, practical sessions and uh, anatomy laboratory. And they need to be assessed uh, similarly. A simple example is that we cannot give a driving license to somebody who knows all the rules of uh, traffic on the road without seeing him the ability to drive safely on the road. So that is the concept of constructive alignment. The next is appropriate method of assessment. If we use Miller's pyramid, the first two levels, knows and knows how, can be assessed by written examinations. Shows how level can be assessed by using clinical simulations like OSCE whereas the demonstration or does level has to be seen during the work-based uh, uh, work based assessment. And on top of that comes the entrustable professional activities, means although the student has demonstrated to the examiner uh, in the workplace, but is the examiner confident that student will be able to do or perform the similar uh, activity in the real ground, uh, in the field or in the hospital. So having clear the concept, those three concepts, let's move forward and try to understand the blueprinting for assessment and blueprinting for curricular content. What is blueprinting? Blueprinting is defined as a complete plan that explains how to do or de uh, develop something. That is a very comprehensive short uh, definition. It's a complete plan that explains how to do or develop something. A systematic approach to planning tests while talking about blueprinting for uh, assessment. It is an approach that documents what students should know and be able to demonstrate on each assessment. To ensure that the assessments are consistent with the course learning outcomes, and address truly the important learning outcomes in a balanced manner, it is important that assessments be developed according to a well thought out plan or blueprint for assessment. The link between constructive alignment and blueprinting, the congruence between the three pillars of education, the three pillars means the content, the teaching learning strategies and assessment. So the congruence between these three pillars 
of education can be facilitated by blueprinting. It ensures the assessment tasks are aligned with the intended learning outcomes and teaching learning activities. Blueprinting for assessment. The blueprinting refers to a map or a table of specification for assessment. And it is to ensure that all aspects of the curriculum and educational domains are covered by the assessment program over a specified period of time. Now, here is an important point of specified period of time. When we are talking about blueprinting of assessment, that does not mean that we have to cover everything in our annual examination. It can be part of continuous assessment and other assessments as well. Means that once we have blueprinted the assessments and we know the content, then we can divide that content uh, on, in different uh, portions uh, some of it can be assessed during continuous assessment and other at the annual or summative assessment. The blueprinting for curricular content, now this is a relatively less emphasized uh, concept uh, in the literature. Although there are a lot of papers on blueprinting for assessment, but not much is written on blueprinting for curricular content, and we will talk uh, about it in a bit detail. A test blueprint is a natural extension of the learning outcomes and the course objectives. It helps curriculum developers to match various competencies with the course content and the appropriate modality of assessment. To ensure that curricular content is consistent with the program learning outcomes and course learning outcomes, and that all the important content has been taught or learned adequately using appropriate teaching learning approaches, following a well thought out plan is blueprinting of curriculum content. Here we can see different component. The it, first thing it, it is that the content is consistent with the learning outcomes. Number two, all the content has been taught adequately using appropriate. So that is another component that it must be taught or learned by using appropriate method. And it should be planned in advance. Uh, and that is the blueprinting for curricular content. Now, this is uh, two important statements here, which differentiate between test blueprint or blueprinting for assessment and blueprinting for curricular content. Test blueprints describe the content to be covered by a test, along with other important features, for example, emphasis given to each topic and the the assessment format. Whereas curricular content blueprints describe the content to be taught and learned to achieve program learning outcomes along with other important features. Here, emphasis given to each topic and the teaching learning format. I think these two statements uh, make it very clear the difference between blueprint for assessment and blueprint for uh, curricular content. A test blueprint is also known as a test plan, table of specifications, or test specifications. The sources of information for test blueprints include learning outcomes, course outlines, teaching learning methods, and other uh, curricular materials. And the same sources and principles are used for identification of curricular content. Primary function of blueprinting for assessment is 
to support the validity of assessment with regard to its content, or in other words, content validity. It helps to align assessment items <coughs> with the intended learning outcomes and student uh, learning experiences. Content validity is a requirement of every evaluation and is achieved when the evaluation content is congruent with the learning outcomes and the learning experiences. Means again, to align the content along, uh, according to or based on the learning outcomes to the teaching and assessment methods. So in summary, <coughs> excuse me. Blueprinting is the appropriate spread of sampled capabilities involving different systems, different domains, both for teaching and assessment. It leads to constructive alignment. It ensures validity and authenticity, and it avoids unnecessary duplication. That was our second uh, problem statement where the, the similar or same questions are being asked in number of different test methods. For example, nephrotic syndrome in written examination, as well as in long case or short case or OSCE. Are a same system being asked multiple times in different uh, methods of assessment. So blueprinting can help us to avoid this unnecessary duplication. Now having the uh, having clear the, the concept or understanding about the blueprinting, I'll give here some uh, simplistic views of blueprinting, which is being practiced in different uh, institutions. The first one is discipline-based, means distribution of questions based on the input. If you take the first part, that is a CVS module. And then we see the number of sessions. There are 37 lectures, nine practicals, five clinical skill lab sessions, two interdisciplinary seminars, and two problem-based learning sessions. And then these sessions are divided among different disciplines. For example, the 37 lectures being divided into anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, pathology, microbiology, pharmacology, community medicine, and clinical skills. And then based on this input by each discipline, the questions are allotted to these disciplines. And these questions can be further spread based on the type of question, for example, multiple choice questions, single best answer questions, are structured essay questions, extended magic questions, or modified essay question. Whereas the practical component or clinical skill sessions are assessed using OSPI or OSCE. And if you see here that these questions are divided into end of module assessment as well as professional examination. So this means that once we have identified the number of items to be tested, they can be spread over uh, different uh, uh, timings and different uh, opportunities of assessment. So this is discipline-based uh, blueprinting. Another way is a topic-based. Here, if you see the same uh, CVS module, and we have the topics, taught by different disciplines, again, anatomy, biochemistry, physiology, etc. And then there are questions from each topic and further divided into different types of questions. Here, this means that there, uh, this blueprinting makes it, uh, are, uh, uh, the, the gives the opportunity that every topic which has been taught is tested. So students know that there would be questions from each topic. 
so they cannot have a selected uh, uh, study or preparation for the exam. Again, the different types of questions are divided for different opportunities of uh, assessment. Here, if you see the anatomy, the anatomy lecture one to, to lecture four. So lecture one, for example, is being assessed both as a multiple choice question and as a, a short essay question. And that is in end of module, but similar uh, assessment can be done at the professional level. So the third simplistic view of blueprinting is sequencing in clinical examination. For any clinical examination, you can make an exhaustive list of topics which you think should be uh, assessed in that examination. And from that list, first you take out the conditions which would be assessed as a long case. Usually chronic cases with clear history, well investigated patients, these are uh, assessed in long cases. So what we do is that all the topics or all the cases are patients which are being examined in the long case, we strike out from the list. Similarly, we strike out the cases which are being assessed as a short case. Then in OSCE, uh, but it would be usually the procedures like peak flow meter, our communication skills, invest, uh, explaining the investigation results, growth charts, our videos, etc. And then the remaining topics out of which, uh, we, uh, out of that list, that would be examined during modified essay questions. Using modified essay question, usually pathophysiology or emergency scenarios, for example, patient in coma or head injury, which cannot be examined, of course, as a long case or a short case. They can be examined as structured essay question or modified essay questions by creating scenarios. Data interpretation, analytic skills, and decision-making skills all can be assessed by using these structured essay questions and modified essay questions. So once we have strike out all these areas which are assessed in these four uh, uh, methods of examination, the remaining topics can be assessed by using multiple choice questions. In this way, again, we can avoid the duplication uh, of the same topic or questions being assessed in different methods. However, all these three, whether based on this discipline or based on the topic or based on this uh, sequence in clinical examination are in a way very simple, simplistic views of blueprinting. Here is another example of blueprint for uh, OSCE. There are different systems, cardiovascular system, respiratory system, or gastrointestinal system. And then the four different stations, history taking, explanation or communication skills, physical examination and procedures. For example, when we want to assess cardiovascular system, we can have a history on chest pain, explanation, the explaining the drugs which would be given at the time of discharge. Physical examination may be cardiovascular system, Procedures may be taking blood pressure or setting intravenous line. Now, after having this basic uh, or simplistic views of blueprinting, let's look at a comprehensive view of blueprinting. There are a number of papers in the literature who describe blueprinting in different steps. This particular paper gives seven steps in constructing a blueprint. First one, defining the blueprint purpose and scope, which includes which semester or which phase of study 
uh, what courses, what is the assessment tool, what type of questions we are using, how many questions we are using. The second step is tabular, uh, tabulate curricular content based on the learning outcomes, whether it can be clinical presentations or topics, etc. Then the concept of impact and frequency, we will talk in, uh, in quite detail about this to understand that. And then next point is the categorizing the curricular content into must know, should know, and nice to know. And then what percentage of questions must should come from must know component or should know component and nice to know component. So we will go into a bit detail of, uh, of these different points. Here is another paper which describes the blueprinting into four stages. Identify major knowledge and uh, skill domain, delineate the assessment objectives, decide on the assessment format, and specify the category weights. Based on these papers and our personal experience, I have developed nine steps to develop a blueprinting for assessment. And I will describe each one um, by one. The first one is same as we saw in that paper, define the purpose and scope of blueprinting. <coughs> <coughs> for this step, we have to answer five questions. First one, which level, semester, or phase of study the blueprint the blueprint is being prepared for. Number two, which course, anatomy, physiology, or uh, uh, internal medicine, or surgery are involved? Which assessment tools are being used? Uh, they are uh, multiple choice questions or objective structure questions. What should be the total number of questions along with the distribution of questions according to assessment method means the total number of questions and how uh, uh, many of them would be multiple choice questions and how many of them would be the structured essay questions, etc. And then what level of questions are required at that particular level? If it is uh, a continuous assessment or it is a promotional level or is it an exit level? we can use Bloom's taxonomy for this purpose, or we can use Miller's pyramid for this uh, purpose. So it is important that before we go further, we must be able to answer these five questions. The next step would be listing of content. So the curricular content can be listed in many ways according to a curricular setting. <laughs> content may be presented in the form of learning outcomes or topics, lectures and practical sessions, clinical conditions, symptoms, signs, and uh, our themes. Here is an example. This is uh, about the renal course for undergraduate students at University of Calgary. And if you see the column one, where topics are given, and we can see a variety of, of uh, uh, aspects being uh, assessed. Hypernatremia, hyponatremia, etc. means these are the laboratory findings. Then we have clinical conditions like acute renal failure or chronic renal failure. Then we have symptoms and signs like hematuria, edema, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this means that the, uh, the list of content can be a mixture of different uh, 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 topics or different methods of assessment. Number three is a relative weighting of the content on each topic. Now, this is uh, other important aspect. The weightage is based on the impact um, or uh, morbidity or mortality of, of that condition. And it is multiplied by the frequency. 
if it is non-urgent or little preventive potential, weight is one. If it is a serious but not immediate life-threatening, weight is two. And if it is a life-threatening emergency or high potential for prevention, it would be given a number three while calculating the weight. Similarly, the frequency, the rarely seen condition, one, relatively common, two, and very common, three. Now, please keep these things in mind because we will be using these figures when we calculate the, the, the uh, or use the blueprinting for assessment. Here is an example, and uh, the first one is undergraduate phase one. So it means that these students are going into phase two. And this impact and frequency is uh, kept or calculated based on the next stage of the student. So phase one students being assessed for phase two, the impact less important for phase two. So we are not assessing for phase one. We are assessing for the subsequent phase where these students are going to study. So less important for phase two, one important for phase two, two and very important for phase two is three. Similarly, frequency rarely applied in phase two, commonly applied in phase two, and frequently applied in phase two. I think the next one is even more important. Phase two means that these are students who are going to graduate. So the impact and frequency would be based on their next phase, which would be as house officer. So any topic less important for house officers would be given an impact of one. Important for house officers two and very important for house officers three. Similarly, the three grades of frequency rarely applied in clinical practice, commonly applied in cl uh, clinical practice and frequently applied in clinical practice. Now, this is the complete calculation of blueprint. Uh, we have been referring to this uh, table in uh, previous slides. Now, if you see the first one is the column is the conditions. Second is the impact. Third is the frequency. Fourth is impact multiplied by uh, the, the, the frequency. And the fifth one is weight. And then based on that, the number of items. So here, what we do, for example, in hypernatremia, the impact is two, frequency is one. So impact time frequency is two. So once we have calculated all this impact into frequency, we get a total of 80. And to calculate the weight, we divide uh, this component, which is impact uh, uh, times frequency, by this total number and that we would get the weight. So once we have calculated this weight, so then we uh, multiply it by the number of total number of questions we are going to use in that particular assessment and that would give us the number of items. And then we can round up or down these items. For example, here in hematuria, the impact is two, frequency is one, then their multiplication is two, and that two is divided by 80 to calculate the weight. And then because the total number of questions is 60, that is multiplied by the weight, and that gives the number of items or number of questions. So let's say two questions. Then we have to decide that these two questions should be based on the diagnosis, investigation, or treatment. Uh, depending upon the importance. So this is calculation of the, the weight, weight or weighting. Right, the, after this,
Here is another example. Distribution of items in cardiovascular system. Column one are different topics, VSD, <coughs> ASD, PDA, Tetralogy of Allo, Rheumatic Heart Disease, Myocarditis, Infective Endocarditis, and Congestive Cardiac Failure. Then is the frequency. So, and then is uh, impact times frequency. Now, important thing here is that some of the conditions may not be very frequent, but they are life-threatening. So they must be given the, the adequate, uh, uh, in, in fact, they must be part of the assessment. So then we calculate the weight and number of items and round up the items. For example, here VSP, the, the total number comes around 15 questions. And then we can see that what portion can be examined in the clinical examination, like long case, history taking, physical examination, investigation, et cetera, or we can have questions in, in different um, uh, uh, parts of that topic, including pathogenesis and basic sciences and prevention, complications of the treatment or complication of the disease. Right, next step is to categorize the items in terms of priority which means categorize the items in must know, should know, and nice to know. Must know should be the components that that student must pass. If student does not pass that component, they cannot be promoted to next level. Should know is for good pass and nice to know is uh, for distinction. Weightage can be correlated uh, to these categories. Let's say weightage six to nine can be uh, given as must know. However, life-threatening conditions must be included in this category, irrespective of the weightage. Weightage three to four can be given as should know, and weightage one to two can be given as nice to know. And then we have to decide what percentage of questions must or should be from must know, should know, and nice to know. Here is an example. In, in, in this exam, the 60% questions are must know, 30% from should know, and 10% from nice to know. The step number five, is seek opinion on waiting from all relevant groups. So although one has calculated <coughs> this waiting, it is important that the other members or other stakeholders agree to that. And that includes, includes uh, increases the reliability as it is improved by increasing the sample size and the breadth. We must involve like head of the departments and the teachers, and if relevant, even uh, previous learners to establish the weighting of a content area through consensus. It is important that the potential users should be given an opportunity to give an input in, in uh, blueprint creation by, because by involving all the stakeholders in deciding uh, designing this blueprint would make it possible that everybody agrees and is able to use this blueprint either in the continuous assessment or, or during the summative assessment. Step six, decide on number of items, that is the total number of questions. Reliability of an evaluation is affected by two factors that is the number and discrimination of items. As a rough guide, if the average discrimination index of the item is 0.3, then approximately 50 to 60 items are needed to achieve a reliability of 0 0.8. That would be an ideal situation to have a discrimination index around 0 0.3 and to have a reliability of 0 0.8. 
This number increases to 100 if average item discrimination is 0.2 and reliability appears to plateau beyond uh, 100 uh, items. So based on our discrimination, our expected discrimination index and the reliability of the result, we can have a fairly good idea that how many items or questions should be included that in that examination. <laughs> Step seven, allocate items to the content areas. Now, we have the total number of questions. We have already the uh, given uh, weightage to different topics. And based on this information, we can allocate items to each content area. This can be done by multiplying the total number of items like we saw in the previous table on the evaluation by the relative weightage for each uh, presentation or topic. The table we saw uh, previously, the 60 item evaluation on the renal course of Calgary University, that gives seven items to hyperkalemia and this is calculated by the uh, total number of questions multiplied by the weightage. And one question to polyuria again calculated by a total number of 60 questions with weightage of uh, 0.0125. So in this way, we can divide our total number of questions in different topics based on their weightage, which was calculated based on their uh, uh, importance, relevance, and uh, frequency. Step eight, decide on the task for each content area. Based on the number of items, choose tasks or methods of assessment, such as which part would be assessed during history taking, which component in physical examination, investigations, diagnosis, management, uh, prevention, uh, complications, pathogenesis, etc. And the basic sciences. And the last step would be create all assessments based on the blueprint means that this blueprint is not only for final examination or annual examination, it is applicable to all different forms or opportunities of assessment. Like continuous assessment, for example, procedures are assessed as students are learning. Formative assessment for learning, for example, teamwork, and summative assessment of learning, for example, physical examination. Now, benefits of uh, assessment blueprint, it ensures that questions being asked are aligned to learning outcomes. Assessment covers the whole curricular content adequately. Assessment is valid and fair to the students. Assessment focuses on thinking skills and on in-depth knowledge. The content competencies and tools for assessment are rational and balanced. The methods of assessment are appropriate uh, for the areas being assessed, and there are no questions out of syllabus. Another benefit of blueprinting is that it reduces the two major threats to the validity of, of the examination or validity of the questions. One is construct under representation and other is construct irrelevance variance. Construct uh, uh, under uh, representation refers to under sampling or biased sampling of the content domain uh, or the course content. So there may be too few items to sample the domain adequately, but because we are using this blueprinting and we are using the relevance and the importance and the frequency. So the blueprinting can address this issue very well of under representation or over representation. Similarly, the construct irrelevance variation or variance is a systematic error introduced into assessment by the unrelated variables. This means including of flawed items are too easy or too difficult questions. Again, 
blueprinting can take care of this as aspect very well. Now, another interesting question, can blueprinting be distributed to the students? It was reported that distributing assessment blueprint to students does not improve students' performance, but significantly increases the perception of fairness of the evaluation process. So student feels that it is very fair that they know what they are being examined for. The other view is that if we disclose the blueprint to the students, will it lead to strategic learning? That means that if we distribute the blueprint to the students, will they only study the curricular content which will come out in the examination? Theoretically, of course, yes, but based on the study, this theory is uh, unsupported. We have a very simple suggestion. If the total number of curricular content is more than the number of questions, we suggest not disclosing it to students since disclosure of these blueprints may lead to strategic learning. On the other hand, if the number of curricular content is less than the number of questions, for example, we are asking two questions from each lecture, then it is not a problem to distribute the blueprint to the students since they will be studying all the curricular content anyway. So that is blueprinting for assessment. So our next part is blueprinting for curricular content. As I mentioned earlier, that this is the aspect which has been less emphasized in the literature and not much paper are published on that. And I'm going to give you a clear picture of uh, this aspect. This is the slide which you have seen previously also. And I said the very important slide to differentiate between the blueprinting for assessment and blueprinting for curricular content. The test blueprint describes the content to be covered by a test, along with other important features, for example, emphasis uh, given to each topic, like the calculated uh, frequency and the impact and the assessment format. Whereas curricular content blueprint describes the content to be taught to achieve program learning outcomes, along with other important features, that is the emphasis given to each topic and the teaching uh, learning format. The idea is that the emphasis which we calculate for uh, curricular uh, for assessment based on the, the relevance are based on the impact, uh, the, the impact and the frequency, can we apply the same concept to uh, decide the curricular content? That is the whole idea behind this. So blueprinting steps for curricular content. First, translate the program learning outcomes into interestable professional activities or specific learning outcomes. To prepare an exhaustive list of content or components based on the knowledge, skills, attitude related to the learning outcomes or the interestable professional activities are specific learning outcomes. Three, assess the relative weightage of each topic. The, and that includes skill, attitude, and, and the knowledge, <coughs> the same way as we calculate for assessment. And then prioritize the content. Four, distribute the teaching learning time among body system based on the contents. Well, so once we have prioritized the content and we know the content to be taught in that particular posting or particular discipline, we can divide uh, the time which is available to us based on that. However, assess the relative weightage of each body system, address the topics that do not fit into any body system. There would be number of topics which uh, really do not fit into that, for example, end of life and, and similarly uh, other topics. So there should be a separate list of these topics which do not fit 
into any system and they can run uh, uh, in a particular uh, 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 fashion. And then we should remember the spiraling of the content means that the, the, the same topic may be repeated multiple times depending upon the level of the student's difficulty and the, the relevance. Number six, decide the best teaching method for each component. Again, it would depend upon the, the, uh, what we want to achieve. If it involves performance, like I gave the example of lumbar puncture, then of course we have to give an opportunity to students to have hands-on experience. Decide the most appropriate assessment method for each component in the topic. Again, it would be based on the learning outcome. Arrive at a consensus at the department and faculty level. So means everybody must, uh, uh, all the stakeholders must agree to that. Conduct a trial or compare with the original document or with other institutions. So make sure that all the areas are being covered. Implement and monitor, collect feedback. <laughs> and make appropriate changes in the content based on the feedback. Now, next few slides, I will give the practical examples uh, uh, how to identify the curricular content by using a blueprint. First, let's uh, see the clinical component, uh, uh, curricular content of clinical areas. Here is an example. Let's say this is a pediatric posting, and uh, that has to cover all the different systems like respiratory, gastroenterology, nephrology, etc. And then, based on the number of cases we see in, in, in the hospital or outpatient, we can calculate or have the impact, the frequency, and the then multiply impact with frequency and then calculate the, the weightage. And then based on the time available, here I have given example of only three weeks, uh, so our 150 hours. So we can calculate the number of hours or number of items uh, which would be given to each system. For example, here for respiratory, it is, let's say 33 or 34 uh, hours, gastroenterology same, but when you come to endocrinology, it would be much less, or immunology even uh, lesser than that. So, uh, of course, this is not universal. Uh, it would change from uh, place to place, depending upon the impact and frequency uh, of, uh, of different diseases uh, which are prevalent in that particular area. Now, if we go into each system itself, once we have identified the uh, system, then we can go into uh, different uh, topics in that system. We can go other way around as well, that we have, we identify the topics as well. And based on that, we give the duration to that posting. Here is an example of respiratory system. So uh, in, in uh, uh, pediatrics again, so bronchiolitis, pneumonia, foreign body inhalation, asthma, croup, et cetera. Then again, the same formula, impact frequency, impact into frequency, calculating the weight, weightage and number of hours or number of sessions. So this again gives a fairly good distribution uh, of the time and the topics and the uh, content of the curriculum. The examples for basic sciences, the, of course, the uh, basic sciences need to be guided by the clinical relevance. So based on the topics identified in the clinical areas, we would identify the content directly or and, uh, indirectly related to those clinical areas in uh, basic sciences uh, or, or paraclinical sciences, for example, in pathology, pharmacology, microbiology uh, and other, other areas uh, as well. So 
here, if we look at this <coughs> table, this is to show that this is for, uh, the example of, uh, of pathology, systemic pathology, a blueprint for uh, paper two. And we calculate the, the, the topics which uh, must know and uh, desirable to know or nice, nice to know. So if we can use this for assessment, we can reverse it to identify the curricular content using the same concept. I think that uh, brings us towards the last uh, couple of slides. Now, categorizing the content in relevance to cl uh, uh, clinical uh, areas. And if we have modular curriculum, means the preclinical and paraclinical disciplines, then each discipline uh, identifies the topics in relation to clinical relevance and proportionate duration and time is calculated uh, accordingly. And even if a traditional curriculum, the same principles would apply. Now, here is an example. <clears throat> Categorizing the content in relation to clinical relevance uh, within a discipline. For example, we are talking about blood supply. Now, blood supply to brain, heart, lungs, kidneys, GIT, skeletal muscle, fascia, pleura, etc. Now, here, rather than having the impact, we see the clinical relevance. For example, for brain, heart, lungs, kidney, clinical relevance three, frequency three, and we calculate the the, the uh, multiply the relevance and frequency in nine. And then based on that, we calculate the weight and then divide this based on the, uh, the uh, time available to us. So in th this case, we will be, let's say, spending uh, 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 for uh, these uh, areas which are highly clinical relevant, they would get the maximum time as compared to uh, areas which are, are uh, less relevant like fascia and pleura. So this is an example uh, to illustrate the point. Uh, uh, the time distribution or relevance, you may not agree with that uh, because it changes from institution to institution, but this is to illustrate the point. With that, I thank you for your uh, attention and uh, I will be happy to answer if you have any questions. <coughs> yes, any questions? Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Kri. Yeah, Karim, please. Uh, yes, yes, please. As is Dr. Karim Adin from uh, University of Bisha College of Medicine. Thank you very much, Prof, for this elegant presentation. We throw light uh, to this uh, very important uh, issue. Uh, however, one point need more clarification to me: the number of questions in order to ensure reliability. You gave example. If you set 60 questions, you will depend on discrimination of 0.3. As yes. far as I know, the discrimination will be decided after the test. Uh, when we look at the psychometric analysis, we we'll look for discrimination. So before the test itself, how could we determine the total number of questions which could ensure the reliability of the test or improve the reliability of the yes. test? Thank you, you, are very you are absolutely right, sir. Absolutely right. Of course, discrimination we would know after the test, not before the test. But here, what I mean is that based on your previous experience, uh, based on your previous experience and previous calculation, and as you know, sir, you cannot be 100% accurate. So we okay. have to, to have some idea. Uh, okay. and, and once you have calculated and then you do the discrimination later after the test, then we would learn even more and we would be more accurate in the next examination. Thank you.
Yes. Uh, uh, Sir, Nagar. can I ask something? Uh, yeah, uh, Prof, just a minute. Uh, uh, Dr. Okay. Dr. Nazar. Uh, yes. Thank you very much, Professor, for your uh, very nice presentations. I'm Dr. Nazar Haddad from the College of Medicine University of Basra, Iraq. Um, uh, I'm greatly interested in the blueprint, and what I want to know uh, is there is a place for bloom taxonomy to be added in the table of the blueprint? Uh, because uh, as we see that the, only the number of the positions, but what is the level of the knowledge that will, will be examined is not determined or not appear in the blueprint example that you have shown. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I, I think that that's absolutely right. And as I have mentioned, when you want to decide the level of questions, the must know and should know and nice to know, you, can, you have to use Bloom's taxonomy or Miller's pyramid to identify those questions based on the level of the student. And also whether it is a promotional examination or exit examination. Yes, Prof. Okay, I just wanted to ask you, do you think that taking senior students into co-creation of Blueprint will be an effective move? Yeah. Like those who have gone from first year to fifth year, fourth year or fifth year, they have seen the relevance of topics. Right. So will it be okay to take those students into consideration, into a focus group, and then get the blueprinting drafted with their yeah, help? I, yeah, absolutely right, Prof. I, I think I have mentioned that. So once you have calculated the weighting yourself, mm. then you can discuss with other stakeholders, including these students that, especially, for example, okay. if in the exit examination, talking to house officers, that what yes. do they think about this topic? Is it important? Should it be taught and uh, should it be assessed? I think that is a very, very useful and you are absolutely right. In yeah, because now that. I am in India. Yeah. So India has got a very precarious condition. They have gone into CBME. Right. But they have still the traditional way of three subjects in first year and the four subjects in second year and moving on like that. Yeah, yeah Prof, it is a learning curve. It is a learning yeah. curve and the, uh, so the uh, relevance of topics will be best judged by them rather than we saying that this is more important and that is more important. That's absolutely what right. Uh, absolutely you, right. You. Okay. Uh, I am Dr. Dr. Sharif. Hello. I am Dr. Sharif. So my question is what are the most important parameters to assess the credibility of exam? The, the, basically, we what we use is the discrimination index and reliability uh, and the difficulty index. Uh, so those are the parameters uh, which help us to assess the, the credibility of uh, an assessment. Uh, I think those are uh, at least are, uh, I, I know only of those areas which can help us to assess the credibility of, uh, of an examination. The difficulty index, discrimination index, and reliability. And as I mentioned in, in my slide, that if we have an idea of discrimination and reliability, then we can get the number of questions required. But of course, then we have to divide those questions based on, on either Bloom's taxonomy or are their relevance. Right, uh, Dr. Uh, Ahmad Rahoma, please unmute yourself. Uh, in, in a short prof, uh, can, can uh, uh, compare between the blueprint for uh, final assessment or final pro exam and the master uh, degree? Uh, is there any comparison between the two? Uh, is it Dr. Ahmad? can compare the final bro yes, exam. I, I, regarding... I, I can hear you, Dr. Ahmad, and I can recognize you as well. Uh, thank you, thank you, bro. Right. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah. in final bro exam, because some examiners request the whole exam questions, for example, the MCQ to be more difficult. Uh, uh, 
So can have a, a rapid comparison between the final pro exam questions, either MCQ or uh, MEQ or uh, whatever the questions with the master program or, um, or the master assessment? Uh, you see, uh, Prof, the, the, there are, I think, two or three criteria. One is the relevance, the impact, the frequency. And the second is the, as I said, the the using uh, uh, Bloom's taxonomy. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, uh, of course, the level of questions in postgraduate would be of higher level. More difficult. While, while using. But when we talk about, as I said, that we divide into must know, should know, and nice to know. Nice to know. And must know are those questions which student must be able to answer to uh, to to pass the exam. The so, basics. Yeah. So then you have to uh, divide uh, or decide yourself what percentage of questions would come from each category. Yeah. Uh, right. Uh, yes. Yeah. You yeah, you are absolutely right. The same thing can be used both for undergraduate and postgraduate. Okay. Thank you, bro. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nigat. Assalamualaikum. Thank you, well, sir. As usual, really interesting presentation. Uh, my question is uh, the detailed blueprint which will be developed, um, whether for traditional or for uh, integrated system, will it be shared with the students and detail as it is made? And secondly, if it is shared, uh, uh, your your voice is breaking, uh, uh, Dr. Nigat. I got your uh, first question about sharing the blueprint with the students. As I mentioned earlier, that if the questions are more than the content, then you can share the content will be given the same value. Sorry, uh, Dr. Nigat, your voice is breaking. Maybe I'll come back to you. Right. Uh, Dr. Ahmad Mishwani. Please unmute yourself. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, <clears throat> Assalamu alaikum, everybody. I am uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed Hussain Mishwani from Peshawar, Pakistan. Sir, there is a uh, small question uh, which is very commonly asked and requested from, from the uh, uh, Faculty of Basic Sciences. Uh, in uh, our setup, as you know, the anatomy, physiology, and biochemistry, these are the basic subjects which are taught in first professional examination. And when we um, uh, make a uh, prepare a combined uh, uh, paper in assessment, the main complaint or concern of the some of the uh, subjects which tested that if <clears throat> if the students suppose uh, uh, totally ignore a part of uh, a subject, suppose biochemistry, if uh, there is thirty percent <laughs> part from the biochemistry based on the weightage and impact and everything. And if the student do that, even then the student gets 70% uh, marks from the other uh, subjects and they can uh, have, have the option of selective study. Uh, how can we address this uh, problem? Yeah, Prof, uh, it, it is very simple. You can make uh, compulsory that student must pass each component. They, 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 they must uh, pass biochemistry, they must pass physiology and, and anatomy are at least some minimum. If not 50%, then at least get 40% marks from biochemistry and 40, uh, the minimum. So once students know that they, they cannot pass the examination without passing each or have at least obtaining minimum score from each discipline, they, they would study it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. You yeah. solved our problem. Thank you. Dr. Fahad, Dr. Fahad Azam. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, so thank you so much for the beautiful presentation. Sir, my question is <laughs> that who should rate content for impact and frequency? So I mean, if I am the course director of a module, should I rate questions myself for impact and frequency or should I ask the faculty members who took these sessions to rate their content for frequency and impact? I think it's uh, involving all these stakeholders. If as a, as a head 
you do it yourself, you would not succeed. It is important that each member of the department and other stakeholders, they are involved. You might have a suggestion. Uh, you can create a suggestion and then present to the department and take their uh, input on that. That is the only way for successful implementation of blueprint. If you do it yourself and try to force on them um, the, and they have different ideas, uh, it may not succeed. So, so involving, then, involving everybody is very, very important. So then a follow-up question would be, should I, should I take their input and take the average of their impact and frequency numbers or should I try to make them uh, build a consensus on one number? I, I think uh, it should be consensus because um, the, the, we, we cannot use democratic uh, uh, way for, for these academic things. Uh, it it uh, best thing would be to arrive at a consensus and have a discussion and uh, the people should be able to convince each other. Thank you, sir. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Dr. Farah. Assalamualaikum, sir. Thank you for a nice presentation. Sir, I want to know that how we can, uh, what is the mechanism to get the discrimination index or reliability for the other method of assessment apart from MCQs? Like uh, we are uh, going through SCQs or other method of assessment. So how, what is the mechanism to get that reliability and difficulty uh, index? Yeah, uh, I don't think there is, uh, that is uh, as simple as uh, MCQs because for multiple choice questions, you are, uh, optic uh, um, a reader would give you the figures. But I think for uh, other methods of assessment, it has to be some kind of discussion and consensus within the department. Uh, I, I don't know any, any method uh, of calculating this discrimination and difficulty index for uh, uh, other, uh, except if you want to calculate uh, manually. So there are formula, uh, uh, available to calculate it manually, uh, but that would be quite quite difficult. Right, Dr. Narmin, Dr. Narmin Atia. Yes, uh, salam alaikum. Wa uh, salam. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Dr. Narmin Atia, Professor of Forensic Medicine, Zagazig University, Egypt. Um, there, ex there exists a certain point in evaluating um, the impact of, base, of basic science content. Is there any other measurable or more standardized criteria to evaluate which is important for basic sciences to the clinical sciences? It will help me in, in post blueprints in the blueprint for curriculum content and in the blueprints related to the test, which is important to uh, 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 which items, which is important for the basic sciences that will help me uh, to, uh, for the transition of phase one to phase two. This specific uh, phase or level uh, of evaluating the, what's important of the basic sciences to the clinical sciences, um, I need more specific criteria to, to, weigh, to evaluate the impact. How can I right. evaluate okay. the impact of basic right. sciences? Thank you. Thank you very, much. Yeah. very, very important aspect. Uh, Dr. Narmin, one thing we should be clear about it, that uh, our objective of or our aim of undergraduate education is to produce a safe house officer. We are not producing anatomists, we are not producing physiologists, or we are not producing biochemists. But we are working towards uh, producing a safe house officer. And uh, this means that we should know the what kind of knowledge, what kind of uh, skills or attitude a graduate should have to be a safe house officer. And based on that, the contribution, the most important contribution from the basic sciences should be uh, included in teaching and assessment. Uh, that includes anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, and, 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 uh, and other areas. So other, in other words, what we used to, uh, I still, I think, call is, for example, applied anatomy or surgical anatomy. Similarly, applied physiology, uh, because we, we, as I said, we are not producing anatomists and physiologists, but we are working towards 
producing a safe house officer. And basic sciences are uh, playing a very, very important role in helping the clinical sciences to produce safe house officers. As I give the example of lumbar puncture, so that is a very, very relevant area. So like, for example, the surface anatomy of uh, uh, spinal uh, column and the physiology of, let's say, the components of CSF. And so those would be very, very important and relevant. So, so I, I think that should, if we keep that thing in mind and we know that what are, what we call is uh, untrustable professional activities are specific learning outcomes, which we want our house officers to know, uh, and we would thought. clearly know that yes, one yes, is yes, yes, by yes. the basic yes, 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 yes. So, yeah, I hope yes, that answered your question. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank Dr. You. Iram Gilani. <clears throat> Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum salam. Sir, thank you very much for uh, your very uh, constructive presentation. Uh, you have mentioned that uh, we should uh, seek opinion uh, of stakeholders during waiting. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, where does standard setting uh, uh, for MCQs and OSCE uh, fits in uh, in this blueprinting? The the standard setting uh, we we had. Uh, 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 the, our previous session, and if you know, even in standard setting, all the stakeholders are involved. The, we, we need, uh, let's say, if we are using the, the uh, usual methods of standard setting, then all the stakeholders give their opinion about each uh, component. I think they go quite uh, in line in uh, uh, with, with both standard setting and the, the blueprinting because both are related to the, the relevance and, and the impact. So they, they are uh, in a way helping each other rather than going against each other. I hope that uh, answers your question. Uh, sir, uh, there is a supplementary question. Yes. Uh, what I have uh, learned from literature uh, is that in standard setting, we involve only experts uh, from that particular field. Uh, yes, the, the, for example, if you are doing standard setting on, uh, let's say, anatomy, anatomy questions, then apart from anatomist, it would be nice to have, for example, surgeons involved uh, in that. So it's not only the experts, but the relevant people as well. And uh, in, in, in real life practice, for example, if you go by one method, they'll say that five to 10 experts. So in real life, it may not be possible to have five anatomists at one time available uh, sitting and discussing those. So in that situation, it would be useful to invite other relevant people. As I said, if it is anatomy, involve, uh, inviting surgeons would be a good idea uh, to, to, uh, so that they can contribute in that standard setting. Does that answer your question? Um, uh, yes, sir, because uh, 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 in our uh, practice, we do not do standard setting. There is a fixed uh, uh, criteria for pass and fail, and we do not revise that criteria uh, for each and every examination. So uh, to me, standard setting is a theoretical uh, concept because uh, we do not frequently uh, apply this uh, for each examination. But madam, there, there are institutions which are applying that. So for them, it is not theoretical, it is practical. Our institution, for example, is using standard setting for OSPI or OSCE. So for us, it is something practical, not just theoretical. So it depends uh, uh, because that needs a lot of extra work and whether the, the academic staff and the administration of institution is willing to put in that effort. So uh, obviously uh, it's not an easy task, but there are a number of institutions 
uh, who, who are using this. As I mentioned in, in our institution, uh, at, least, at least we are using for OSCE, uh, the, the standard setting. Right, uh, Professor Rashid. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Alam, sir. Uh, sir, uh, uh, Professor uh, Brigadier Professor Ahmed uh, Mishwani asked a very important question about integrated assessment, and you made it very simple that uh, the students should pass each section. The issue arises that when, uh, say, in an integrated assessment, student passes all the subjects except biochemistry and passes the OSP of the biochemistry. So what about the supplementary exam? That should be taken in whole block and or that should be taken up whole paper or the students shall appear in only that particular uh, segment of the uh, paper? Yeah, uh, uh, Prof, no, the, actually there, there, there's a, a, a few points about it. When I say that student must pass each component, uh, biochemistry physiology uh, means that we are assessing them separately so that is not an integrated curriculum. The integrated curriculum uh, demands integrated questions as well. So then there wouldn't be any uh, uh, discrimination whether physiology, biochemistry or, uh, 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 or uh, anatomy because the questions are integrated. My answer was in relation to if we do not have integrated and we have separate biochemistry questions, anatomy and physiology, then student must, must pass that. Now, again, the whether student should pass the, if it is integrated uh, curriculum, then the supplementary has to be integrated as well. So that means that student has to reappear in the whole paper and which would include all the subjects. But if it is a, a traditional system and each uh, subject is being examined separately, then of course you can decide that a student should, uh, may appear only in that particular paper. So if for example, you have a separate paper for biochemistry and anatomy and physiology, and student has failed, let's say biochemistry, then you may decide that student should appear only in biochemistry. But in integrated curriculum, it would be the whole examination because the questions are integrated. Uh, uh, sir, uh, we, we have integrated the teaching, integrated curriculum. The paper is integrated, but the questions are like that, that say in cardiovascular system, there are five questions from physiology, three from anatomy, three from biochemistry, but the, there is one single paper. Now the student can pass all the paper uh, by leaving the biochemistry. What Dr. Ahmed Mishwani said that the student leave biochemistry because there are only two or three questions. So they don't study biochemistry. So if the student uh, fails that portion of a single paper, we, we want to know about that. The paper yeah. is one. Yeah. There are uh, questions from all the disciplines, yeah. but uh, we know that this is there is separation. So this, this is an means this yes. means, uh, Prof, this means that the, at the end of the day, from the paper, you can separate biochemistry, physiology, and anatomy. Yes, yes. yes right. that's it. So th actually, that is not integrated. That means that you are examining three subjects in one go, but it's not integrated. Right. Yeah. So integrated means that a question uh, asked has some component of anatomy, physiology, and biochemistry at the same time. So, so to say that that is an integrated paper, uh, that's not right. So then uh, there are separate segments. What about supplementary in that case, like we are having? Yeah, if, if we, as I said, that if we are examining three disciplines separately, although in one paper, but uh, let's say you can say part A is biochemistry, part B is anatomy and part C. So then you can decide that because we are not using integrated and student has passed the other two, uh, the, uh, has uh, passed those areas, but so it is uh, your local decision. To me, if it is not integrated, then we can separate those papers. Thank you very much. Okay, Dr. Muhammad Bakir. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. 
Hello, I'm from Sudan, uh, College for Science and Technology. I'm uh, very much um, informed by this uh, very clear uh, presentation. Thank you very much. I'm going, I'm coming back to the number of the questions because all the blueprinting depends on the number of the questions. And as you can see, there is no an ideal theory that lead us to decide about the number of the questions. This will take me back to the, uh, my idea, which is the continuous assessment. Uh, as we do here in our college, we are using the team-based learning, <coughs> including the IRAT and GRAT, throughout right. the course about uh, the, we are uh, adopting the great integrated course curriculum. And we are in the continuous assessment, students may have three TBL, which include about 10 to 15 questions. That means more than 45 questions. And, uh, this will will take part of this as a summative at the end of the course. And then the end of the course will be 60. Then will be the content validity will be more than as we are doing empirically uh, at the end of the course, 60 or 80 or 10 or 100. There is no fixed uh, methodology for that. So I think to, um, to, to uh, 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 deal with this problem, the number of the questions at the end of the exam, we have to concentrate more on the... Sorry, we, we lost you, uh, uh, Dr. Bakir. Uh, if uh, you can hear me, the use of uh, TBL uh, as, as an assessment can be part of continuous assessment. And you can give some percentage, let's say 20% or 30% to continuous assessment. But still, you need a summative assessment. And for summative assessment, I, as I have mentioned, that it depends upon the reliability and the discrimination. So if you are aiming at discrimination of 0.3 and reliability of 0.8, which is uh, really a good uh, measurement, uh, you need to have uh, 50 to 60 number of questions. But if you want to have uh, discrimination of 0.2, then of course you need to have increased number of questions. With that reliability may go up to 100 questions. So it all depends upon what your institution is aiming at. Okay, Dr. Abida Shaheen. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Alam, uh, for giving uh, such an inspiring talk like always. Uh, it's Dr. Abida Shaheen from Pakistan. So I have a query related to blueprint designing for curriculum content and uh, assessment. Right. Uh, as it has already been mentioned about the consensus of faculty members on both these processes and the faculty members who are involved in those processes uh, right. in delivering uh, uh, the curriculum as well as in designing the assessment. So there could be disagreement on the weight of the blueprint while uh, uh, assigning teaching hours in curriculum blueprint and then distribution of items in the assessment blueprint. So uh, I have this question that should both these blueprints be developed uh, uh, simultaneously at the same time or they could be developed separately? So the, sorry, you, you are asking, the first thing is that we, we should arrive at a consensus and we should have yes. a, a, a yes. discussion uh, and, and to arrive at a consensus. Are yes. you asking about uh, annual and supplementary? No, no, I am saying that, for, for instance, that if I have a module and if I'm designing, uh, 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 designing a curriculum blueprint for my specific module, and then I am designing uh, an assessment blueprint of that specific module. So to avoid the disagreement, there could be disagreement on the, uh, on the assignment of teaching hours in the uh, module, while there could be disagreement on the distribution of MCQs or SCQs in the assessment blueprint. So both right. these should be developed simultaneously or they could be developed separately. I think that is an excellent idea. That is an excellent idea that in one sitting we do both curricular content as well as the uh, assessment and uh, it would make your life very easy. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I was so, of this opinion, yes. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think that's an excellent idea to do these two things in one sitting so everybody can see the relevance and see that the, uh, the things which are being given, uh, uh, you say, importance in teaching are also being assessed adequately. 
I think that's a, that's a very good idea. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Ahmad Mishwani. Unmute yourself, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir, for giving me another chance. But uh, I just wanted to uh, clarify uh, my previous point. And actually, uh, the problem, uh, I think, uh, because the integration is uh, in the preliminary or initial stages, and I think if not most, at least some of the institutions. So the basic problem is that uh, development and training of the faculty, as you have rightly said, though we have started the integrated modular system, but at the end of the day, when the uh, faculty prepares questions, the questions are actually not uh, integrated. As you have rightly said that the individual question should be integrated and it should contain uh, the applied basic sciences along with when we are preparing the MCQs or SEQs scenario best, then an integration question will serve the purpose. It will include the basic sciences as well as the applied part also. But uh, so far with the questions, though it may be mixed or it may be in the form of different sections in the paper, but they are the questions are actually clearly from anatomy, physiology, or biochemistry. So the student can pick and choose the questions. So you have very rightly uh, pointed out in a previous, uh, in response to your previous question, that uh, even though uh, until now, most of the senior faculty, they are uh, <clears throat> trying and they are adopting the previous traditional uh, uh, course of anatomy, physiology, and biochemistry. Uh, and the basic concept of that core curriculum, which you have very rightly explained that we are not going to prepare uh, the basic sciences experts. And probably in some of the cases, the students of undergraduate MBBS are taught the same anatomy course as they are taught for the MPhil or post-graduation. So first thing is the core curriculum and the second, which you have rightly said, the applied basic sciences that concept should be uh, adopted. And the another important question, uh, or I think a suggestion or a concern, which I will share with you is, in, uh, I, I have already uh, in one of the previous uh, workshops, I pointed out this question, that is the uh, non-MBBS faculty, because even from the first year, the basic sciences, when we are teaching the applied basic sciences, the non-MBBS faculty, they have no or very little concept of the clinical or the applied part of these basic sciences. So we should also uh, address this issue of non-MBBS faculty also, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I think Prof. Rashid also asked the, uh, the, that area as well. Now. I, I suggest that the anatomist, physiologist, uh, biochemist, and other basic sciences people should sit down and have a cup of tea together. And uh, when you are uh, vetting these questions, of course, uh, you, uh, as I said, it's not easy. You have to spend time and energy and sit down together and find a time. Uh, it's, I know it's very difficult to find a common time uh, among everybody to, to share, but nowadays, uh, we are using this online uh, meetings as well to, to discuss these things. So uh, I'm sure you will achieve that uh, in due course of, uh, of time. Uh, so, uh, uh, but uh, obviously to begin with, there would be some issues. Uh, uh, I, and sir, I think and you have rightly pointed out that and suggested <coughs> that for the basic medical sciences uh, paper, the surgeon should be uh, contribute uh, or should be present as an ex subject specialist with the anatomy paper and a physician while setting up the physiology and biochemistry that's right. paper. That's absolutely right. Absolutely right. Absolutely. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, Prof. Rashid. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, as there are no questions, I want to get a chance for another question. When we have, whenever we are talking of integration and uh, modular, and we always talk of the basic sciences. 
Uh, what about clinical science the integration of gynae with PEDS, with surgery, with IV and T? We are not, ne never talking of that integration on their side. Can uh, you please comment uh, on that, that side? That, 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 yes, that, that's interesting aspect uh, that the integration is mainly being emphasized on uh, in uh, basic sciences. Having said that, there are institutions where they have, they go by, by scenarios. I think in uh, there are 120, around 120 or 130, uh, you know, uh, scenarios they have and students go by them. For example, abdominal pain. They don't go by, by discipline. They go by, by these uh, scenarios or symptoms or signs uh, to do that. Uh, but only very few institutions, only very few institutions. Though we have some common sessions, uh, for example, PEDS and uh, uh, obstetric and gynecology, we have some common sessions. For example, uh, they, they have a patient, uh, our scenario of uh, uh, gestational diabetes, and uh, then the pediatric would deal with the uh, infant uh, of a diabetic mother, these together. So some, some topics, are the, the timetable is arranged in such a manner that the two uh, or three disciplines can come together. Another area is what we call is interdisciplinary seminar, seminars or uh, activities. So here is that uh, a topic where more than one discipline is involved. They, they are brought together and uh, uh, they are taught together. But you, uh, you are absolutely right that we, because uh, we, uh, we are still discipline-based uh, in, uh, in clinical years. So there is, uh, uh, there is some, some horizontal integration in clinical years, but there is no vertical integration. Right. <coughs> uh, Dr. Laiku Zaman. Uh, as alaikum, sir. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. much for sending me that uh, time distribution, sir. <laughs> you are most welcome. It was a pleasure. Thank you indeed. Thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation as always. Uh, great to hear all of this. Uh, this discussion is a little off track, I guess, but still, uh, I think it's important. I, I wanted to say just one thing. Isn't it that integration is really several steps? It's not just a matter of saying that there's an integration. I mean, uh, vertically, laterally, and then yeah. uh, if I correctly remember, there are 11 steps yeah, to integration. The, the Harden, so, Harden has, uh, Harden has uh, described yeah. those uh, 11 steps. Absolutely. So yeah. uh, considering that, uh, there is a lot of a space for integration. And going from the first to the last step is a huge leap. Uh, we Most of us are really probably somewhere halfway, um, somewhere yeah, halfway. I that. think most of us are at eight or nine level, eight or nine, level nine. Yeah, we, if at all we reach that actually. Yeah, actually. yeah. Uh, so no, I'm, I'm talking about here in Malaysia. We are oh, really? In, yeah, eight or nine level. Yes. Well, that, that is wonderful actually, because of, uh, <coughs> so many of our colleagues from Pakistan and maybe also from the other side across the border from India, would agree that uh, the levels of integration that we have reached has hardly been to the, to the ninth step. We are probably more at the fifth, sixth step, if at all we do it. Right. So there is a lot of scope for integration and really it shouldn't be a matter of saying that we are integrated, it should be a matter of integrating in actuality. Uh, that's right, that's right. <laughs> thank you very uh, much. Thank you very much for your comments and thank you everybody for uh, uh, your support and uh, just uh, as usual, I want to share the uh, last uh, two, two slides. Um, um, the, sorry, the, uh, my usual last uh, two, two slides. Um, the, So one is that uh, our uh, next webinar uh, would be in, uh, in, uh, in July. We will be skipping June because uh, I would be traveling and would not be here in, in Malaysia. So uh, I'll have to skip June. So we'll do it in July. And uh, 
my last but not the least, in fact, very important slide is uh, uh, to make this proposal to each participant to donate one USD or equivalent amount in your local currency to any deserving individual in your neighborhood or any public welfare organization in your community. This would be our contribution uh, to the community apart from medical education. Thank you very much, everybody, and see you, inshallah, in next webinar. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Allah Thank Hafiz. You, sir. Allah Hafiz. Thank you, sir.